Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today and a very warm welcome to the webinar Fashionably Green. This event is presented by the Design Singapore Council and the National Design Centre. I'm Felicia from the Design Singapore Council and I will be your MC for today. Today's session, Fashionably Green, will explore what sustainable fashion is and how fashion labels are going green in innovative ways. Our panel of speakers will be sharing more about themselves and their work in the first half of the session before we move into a panel discussion and Q&A segment for the second half. And with that, it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers for today. We have with us Jin Lee, co-founder and designer of Jin Lee Studio, a contemporary women's wear label that prides itself on creating thoughtfully designed pieces. Joining us is also Felicia Toh, founder of NOST, a loungewear label that creates beauty sustainably by working closely with makers and vulnerable communities. And last but definitely not the least, we have with us from the UK, Arabella Turek, Chief Operating Officer of Petit Pli, a material technology company that makes clothes that grow with you. Moderating our session for today is Daniel Boy, Creative Director and Founder of The Front Row and Singapore's very own godfather of fashion. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over the time to Daniel to officially kickstart today's session. Daniel, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Felicia. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Fashion Be Green. Um, so I'm Daniel Boy. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, now, Daniel Boy BC, which stands for Before COVID, I was a fashion showrunner, a fashion curator and a creative director of fashion festivals. Um, with the front row, which was started during COVID, we started the front row as an online portal to support Asian fashion creatives showcase and highlight sustainable fashion businesses, responsible fashion practices, as well as cruelty-free fashion. I'm really excited to be moderating this panel with three very uh, interesting and exciting guests. I'd like to introduce them all to you, um, ladies, as I introduce you, I'd like you to switch on your cameras and give us a one-liner on what you think sustainable fashion means to you. Our first guest is Jin Lee from Jin Lee Studio. Hi, Jin. Hi, Daniel. How are you? <laughs> Good. Tell us, what, what does sustainable fashion mean to you? Um, for me as a designer, I believe it's to not produce if it's not needed. Okay, so I'm not less into, you know, kind of like investigating the materials. Those, those are important. But for us, it's if we can don't produce it, try not to produce it. So less waste. Fantastic. Less waste. Okay, our next guest is Felicia To. Hi, Felicia. Hello. Um, How yeah, are you? So, <laughs> I'm Felicia as well. Yes. Um, for us, um, it's about longevity and being respectful towards people and environment. So our approach to sustainability is simple and consists of two parts. Uh, firstly, we think carefully about who we work with in the making of our clothing. And in our case, that's artisan families and marginalized communities in Asia. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we think about how it's made, how clothing can be made in ways that are gentle on the planet. Fantastic. Um, okay, well, we'll hear from you a little later on. Meanwhile, let me introduce my third guest. She's all the way from London, Arabella Turek. Hi, Arabella. Hello, Hello good, good afternoon, afternoon or good morning. If <laughs> anyone, anyone is joining me, okay. okay. Um, yes, I'm Arabella, CEO of Petitli. Uh, for Petitli, uh, sustainable fashion means identifying meaningful solutions through generating great user dialogue um, in order to achieve solutions which really stand the test of time and meet those longevity questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to hear from Arabella a little later on. But as you can see, sustainable fashion means different things to different people, but it all ties back to the fact that we are all trying to be more responsible fashion practitioners or consumers. Okay, according to Wikipedia, Sustainable fashion, which is also known as eco-fashion, is a movement and a process of fostering change to fashion products and the fashion system towards greater ecological integrity and social justice. Now, sustainable fashion concerns more than just addressing fashion textiles or products. It addresses the entire manner in which clothing is produced, who produces it, and how long the lifespan of the product is before it reaches the landfill. Now, this sustainable movement combats the large carbon footprint that the fashion industry and fast fashion have created by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, combating air and water pollution, and climate change. All right, um, I'm going to get the labels to talk about their own sustainability journeys and why they made the choices they did a little later on. But first, uh, let me introduce them back one by one to tell us a little bit about each label. Let's start off with Jin Lee. 
So I'm Jin. I'm a designer and a co-founder of Jinli Studio, a women's wear label. So me and Tamil, my partner, we are both designers. So I'm a fashion designer and he's an industrial designer. For us as a, um, as a fashion label, what we do, we do a lot of uh, focusing on exploration of a textile form and fit, and as well the functionality of the clothing who, to who we design for. So as I mentioned just now, for us being sustainable is uh, really to kind of like think about what we do and do it slowly. <laughs> I think one of the thing about uh, being sustainable as a designer is also sustainably tuning out design, like not uh, you know speeding up in such a way that every week is new collection. So we kind of like uh, uh, try to do what we say slow fashion, that just really slow it down. So my strength and interest lie in the way two D transform to three uh, warp around a three D form, and that's for me my personal interest. So a lot of fabric manipulation and also uh, patterning which really interests me. And also in the end of the day, because we work with a body, a user, we call. So we design around the user. So how do I make it more flattering for her? How does she look in it? How does she feel in it? So this is kind of what we pride ourselves for what we do. And one of the technique that we use uh, in, in all the in a lot of like fabric manipulation technique was uh, pleating. So hand mold pleating especially. It's quite a low tech uh, kind of method. Uh, mainly kind of using contour, contour to kind of texturize the fabric and then make it into clothes. So what we do, we try to play with it so that it becomes kind of like the way it, it kind of applying a, our last mile production onto the finished item. Okay, you will see a bit more through the slide and all that. So the project that I kind of wanted to mention is a making shop. We branded it as make. So you see that kind of branding that's called just make in present tense, which is like a, um, that is making while you need it. So basically the whole idea is that we redesign well, the, the key point was that we're trying to address two key issues. We're trying to kind of like uh, tackle two key problems that we have in our industry, the fashion industry. Uh, one of them is excess stock. We all know that, okay? So I don't have to elaborate on that. And also like that, that's kind of changing customer demand uh, for kind of shopping in a brick and mortar shop. I'm also a retailer. So as well as a fashion uh, uh, designer, we also have a retail shop. So we, we felt that those two key, key challenges was what we want to address in our solution. So when we thought through, we thought like, you know, what do we, what are we known for? What do we have? What's the skills that we have? So we kind of like uh, end up with this project that we call making shop. So what we do, we basically redesign everything that we can redesign, okay? So we redesign the way we retail, we redesign the way we produce, the way we design design, <laughs> and uh, also the way we kind of like put the whole thing together. So simply we break the, uh, the whole thing up into modules. So we don't produce the whole item. We just do a base. And if it's, uh, uh, you know, the stripe and all that, you know, we started with a uh, bag and then move on to top and stuff. So a bit smaller object because we are women's wear, but it was just like to allow us to kind of start in a smaller scale and smaller um, pleating size. And uh, so basically that, that was the idea was that we want to assemble the whole thing when people want it, when our customer want it. So the when we design the product, it have to make sense because what we didn't want was to put a sewing machine in the place because it have to be, felt quite designed, the process and the product. And both also because, um, you know, hand mold pleating is quite uh, laborious and it's quite prone to defects and all that, but we really like that. We felt that that's also part of slowing it down. And we also have like make experience recall, which is like basically, um, I mean, we make the bags in the store, but we kind of like allow the consumer or the customer to make it for themselves. So we guide them through the process. We don't charge, you know, for that experience at all. But what we do is that we just guide them through the process because we believe also by changing that relationship, you know, as the owner of the product to being the maker of the product, it changes your relationship to the product and hopefully you will treasure it a bit more, a bit longer. And that's how we felt that we can, you know, change this um, uh, way we consume, uh, consuming too much too fast. Um, we kind of like call it like modernizing the craft so we can localize the production. So this whole project is localized. So we are not, uh, um, we, because of the way it's being built. So we only trigger like uh, the more a laser score, the bags are laser cutted. And uh, obviously the whole thing was split, uh, is split in store. And we also have to build the whole machinery <laughs> by ourselves because we want it to fit into the retail store environment. That was the key. So you see actually in this picture, that little fridge in the end, that's the steamer. Um, yeah, so basically that's what we that's what we do. That's our part in it. That's just how can we change around the way we thought about 
retail and obviously how we think about designing products as well surrounding the customer experience. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jin, for your sharing. Let us now welcome Felicia on screen, please, to share more about NOST. Felicia, over to you, please. Great. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, so just to share a little bit more about NOST. NOST is a sustainable loungewear and home goods label that partners with artisan families in Asia. I'm a practicing architect, and I love to travel, pre-COVID anyway. Um, and NOST was born from a couple of journeys. When I was in India, I went into villages with craft communities and met with heritage artisans who created fabrics out of their homes. That inspired me to start NOST. We design garments from start to end, and our prints are inspired by architecture, such as the concourse building. Our artisans then print on raw fabrics using heritage techniques, such as block and batik printing. Making fabrics from scratch gives us the freedom to decide what goes into each garment, such as the type of dye, and the raw fabric used. Designing the supply chain from start to end became a good springboard to think about sustainability, which essentially is about holistic cycles, designing something from cradle to cradle. A lot of my understanding around sustainability was something I learned from the artisans. For example, one of the artisans uses only natural plant-based dyes for fabric printing. The black in our modular rope was made with iron bought with pomegranate, like the one you see here on the right. Knowing the people who make our clothing firsthand leads to a different way of thinking about sustainability. It makes you think about the impact of dyes used on crops, because traditionally artisans wash fabrics in the rivers, which are surrounded by farmland. We think about the makers who wash and dye the fabrics by hand. Would we want to put our own hands into the dye pot, day in and out, if we were them? When thinking about sustainability, it is a big word, but what comes to mind for me is longevity how to sustain a mode of life in a way that is kind on the planet so that there is continuity and longevity of resource. We approach sustainability in two ways, by rethinking who we work with and how it's made. Because for us, sustainability is not just about the environment, but also about the people who make our clothes. We choose to work with small scale artisan families who have passed their skills down the generations. Many of them tell us that they find it difficult to compete with commercial suppliers because of the time that is involved in making things by hand. Many of their neighbors have given up the trade with children migrating to cities in search of ad hoc work. Um, but we hope to preserve these precious heritage crafts so that it does not become obsolete. We also hope to partner more with marginalized communities in the making of our products. Uh, some of our cushions, our dress and uh, mask collections are ethically produced by two NGOs based in Singapore and India that train and employ women at risk of trafficking and exploitation. Our second approach to sustainability is about being gentle on the planet by considering how things are made. So we use natural eco fabrics such as organic cotton and tensile, um, which are biodegradable uh, and also environmentally friendly dyes. Our clothing comes packaged in reusable cotton pouches instead of single use plastics. Something we are currently working on is to develop artisanal fabrics made from pineapple leaf fibers or PELF for short. This project is called PELF Craft and it's under the Good Design Research Grant. We've partnered with a local company called Next Evo, which collects pineapple leaves from Thailand and converts them into yarns that are blended with tensile and cotton. We then take these yarns and place them in the hands of our artisans based in Indonesia to weave and batik print into new sustainable fabrics. It's exciting for us to be able to bridge old and new to create innovative eco fabrics with a strong heritage story. Southeast Asia is a leading producer of pineapples globally. So for every kilogram of pineapple fruit, two kg of leaves are generated. These excess leaves are usually burnt or landfilled, leading to waste generation and pollution. Converting agricultural waste into usable fabrics is a wonderful opportunity to close the loop. Pineapple fabrics are not new, but it is difficult for our artisans to gain access to the yarns because they are usually processed in small batch cottage industries. So supply is unstable and expensive. But with Pulfcraft, uh, we hope to tap on the commercial technology that makes these blended yarns possible at scale and put them in the hands of these heritage artisans, thus nudging them towards the growing market for eco-textiles and future-proofing their craft. We hope that NOS will be known as the pineapple pajamas brand if this project goes well and uh, that artisans will be able to continue their craft for centuries to come. 
Thank you. Thank you, Felicia, for your sharing. Last but not least, could we welcome Arabelle to join us on screen, please? Perfect. So yeah, I'm Arabelle Tarek. Um, as in my introduction, I am CEO of a particular material technology company based out of London. And um, we've had quite a unique uh, origin. Our founder, whose background is in aeronautical engineering, uh, came up with the idea of Petiti, uh, which is a company which produces primarily grown clothes for the children, uh, because children grow through seven sizes in their first two years on Earth, creating an incredible amounts of waste. Um, when he gifted an item for his nephew in Denmark, by the time it arrived, it was already too small, indicating that there's a plethora of problems within children's wear, but sizing and efficiency leading, as Jenna mentioned, to stock surplus and excess um, creates a huge amount of um, externalities, negative externalities within the fashion industry, which principally impact the health of the planet. But also it signaled uh, for the user that there was a poor intelligence with respect to sizing and, on, and also um, unique sizing between brands. So with all these problems and these data signal points, uh, he decided to use and apply his uh, insights from aeronautical engineering, principally into deployable satellite panels, to create a uh, textile which could grow bidirectionally and expand through seven sizes. It won the UK James Dice Award in 2017 for the proof of concept, and it's now patented. And when it won the award, it uh, caught a lot of attention. It went viral online um, all over the world, which is really, really exciting, especially for uh, a company, which is something uh, which has sustainability to its core and it's at the bedrock, um, as communication is so important, as mentioned by Jen, uh, within the makerspace. Uh, so much about uh, the success of your process and project relies on communication, verbal, uh, not not only physical, um, as is really important at the design stage of the physical product. With the success of the Children's Wear uh, soon after launching, uh, Petit P has launched um, Adult Wear and also uh, Masks, which is really exciting. And we've got more avenues uh, coming to our head. And uh, we've identified all solutions through retaining really great dialogue between our user communities through Instagram, through emails, and even when we launched, uh, because of such viral engagement, uh, we created early on a really great uh, email community. So when we were ready to test products, our community uh, were able to uh, test it and purchase garments, uh, which were pre-commercial uh, viability uh, privately and it sold out within 24 hours, which is really, really exciting. Um, but as mentioned earlier, a real part of our ethos is designing uh, projects and uh, designing ideas and designing uh, statement pieces, which are able to really live in the world of a real human user. And because of our approach, I think we have been very successful in not only translating our medium online, but also within physical spaces. So on account of the approach and the origin, we're currently in the National Design Centre Waste Refinery Exhibition, but we've also been featured in exhibits in the Art Institute of Chicago, the Philadelphia Museum of Modern Art, um, the Science Museum in London. We've got a permanent exhibition at the Victoria Albert Museum of Childhood, opening in 2023 and I think within the sustainable fashion space there's such an opportunity to uh, think differently and act differently uh, in a way that can combine insights from all disciplines. Um, it's not a problem just for fashion designers to fix. I think there's a lot of blame on uh, fashion schools uh, because uh, there has been a preservation of a particular type of model. But uh, for example, in biology, which is uh, my background, uh, I studied uh, neuroscience at undergrad and I'm a firm conservationist. There's always this idea of what is the correct balance of preservation versus conservation. And I think that goes everything from, that can be uh, translated to this uh, communication 
uh, today regarding fashion, what should we preserve from old techniques and old styles of learning, and what should we conserve from the sustainable fashion startup today uh, who are pioneering change. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Arabella, and to Felicia and Jin as well. Can I get all of you to switch on your cameras so that we can plunge straight into this very exciting discussion? I'm going to start by talking about the business of um, sustainable fashion, all right? Taking that first step towards operating a sustainable business. Now, all of you have talked about the why, why you started or why you decided to, to go down the sustainability route. But um, I think a lot of people are very interested to know how you started it. You know, the problems that you had um, looking for um, the R&D material costs and all that. So do you want to um, have um, a little chat about um, taking that first step towards operating a sustainable business? Uh, let's start with Jin. At, um, I think we, we started at a, we, we are a women's wear label before anything. So, I mean, at that point, we never thought that we are not sustainable anyway. It's always about being slow, about being independent label. So I think this uh, being sustainable, this uh, uh, word itself is quite, I think it's quite key over the last uh, few years as we as, as we view it, but for us, I think one of the thing that what we do, what we try to do, like the project that I explained, is kind of like trying to localize where we can and try to reduce where we can. But I think one of the key challenges that we had was changing mindset, changing okay. mindset of suppliers, changing mindset of our staff, changing mindset of uh, everything that has to do with uh, you know this whole system that is built on quantity on uh, speed to market you know even discount you know it's very i think it's mindset change was the toughest that we had to under mm -hmm. undergo uh, right. but besides that the, the business was there so it was just a, a lot to fix in terms of mindset like sure felicia what about you um you know you you've got a really interesting story about your your travels and 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 all that was it difficult in, in taking that first step to start a sustainable business? Yeah, so um, because of my training in architecture and also um, not in fashion per se, mm -hmm. um, I think it led me to approach fashion with a very different lens. Um, yeah, and my journey really started with the artisans and that's where also I, I drew a lot of lessons on sustainability mm -hmm. because they've been practicing these crafts for centuries in ways that um, yeah, are very, very sustainable. Yeah, so um, one of the benefits of being able to work with artisans is also that they produce in small batches. Yeah, so I think like Jin mentioned earlier, one of the big problems in fashion is the generation of waste from excess stock. Yeah, so being able to work with suppliers that are smaller in scale and more nimble with lower order quantities definitely helped in terms of piecing together a supply chain that makes a lot more sense for the environment. Yeah, and also I think because the business model that we kind of landed on um, was had to do with creating fabric from scratch rather than purchasing off, say, um, a supplier or a mill. Um, so that allows us to be very flexible in terms of specifying what exactly goes into it. So for example, we are able to specify the raw material, the organic cotton or the hand cell, um, and also the type of dyes that are used, like they could be natural plant-based or um, low-impact azo-free dyes. Yeah, and um, so because it's kind of happening at a really small scale and, and um, quite intimate, that gave us actually uh, a, a very interesting way to go about sustainability from a small business approach. Mm. Arabella, what about you? Us, we had, as mentioned in the presentation, quite a unique for it. Um, as a student project, uh, CP gained incredible attention. However, the intention of the project was always to live in the real world. So as soon as our founder, uh, exhibited the design and shortly after winning the award he won went out and sought investment so um, a small pocket of money in order to kickstart because that that is <laughs> it's really great uh, when people can um can uh, grow really uh, small in a small way however um, there was such a great leap between the concept to the actual commercial viability and that's pretty impossible to do without money and also pretty reckless from a commercial standpoint or oh, brilliant if um, you just back it yourself as a new graduate but it's better if that um, investment is sought externally so if anyone out there is looking to start a new venture always uh, more heads are better. <laughs> Do you think being in different parts of the world has uh, 
has influenced the way you've, you've decided to approach this, uh, uh, the way you run your business and the direction of your business? For example, Felicia, you mentioned that being in this part of the world and working with the artisans and all that, if you had been based in the West, would your business model have been different? Yeah, that's a good question. I think definitely we are influenced by our context um, and it also directly links to the kind of networks and access that we have. Um, yeah, so I think, for example, now that I'm working on Pathcraft, the pineapple textile project, right? We realized that Southeast Asia is, for example, the uh, one of the world's global producers of pineapples. Yeah, and um, yeah, there, there is another competitor brand that's also producing um, pineapple leaf textiles. Yeah, um, but I think the benefit of being based here in Southeast Asia is that we can keep our um, eco footprint actually pretty small and tight within the region. Yeah, so in terms of the processing, in terms of the raw materials, like where the leaves are harvested from in Thailand, um, to the processing and then shipping it to Indonesia, the, the kind of route or the journey that the materials need to go on is a lot shorter. And that um, is definitely has benefits for the environment. Yeah, so that's my take. One thing I find really uh, interesting is all of you have such diverse backgrounds that are not rooted in fashion. Do you think that um, having such diverse backgrounds has actually helped your journey and, and helped you with R&D? Let's start with, um, okay, let's start with Arabella. <laughs> okay, um, do you think uh, having, for example, a master's in science and technology has actually helped you um, with your research and development and, and, um, and crafting the direction and the aesthetic of your brand? So I think with respect to the masters that I did in history, philosophy, and um, sociology of science and technology, one of the um, <laughs> courses was actually on uh, the political economy of science and R and D. So when we were starting out, a little bit of knowledge uh, uh, and that lens from a macro perspective uh, was really helpful when I was writing applications for grants. So PTP has won a lot of grant funding. So in that sense, um, that's really helpful uh, for design because that's giving the economic base. And then from um, we, the whole team is really diverse as well. I can, so uh, no meeting um, is exited with uh, the original idea, which is the point of the meeting, um, which is great. Uh, so we're always challenging each other and growing which is good friction leads to uh, positive discussions. I'm going to talk about material cost next, okay? Um, specifically with um, someone like Felicia, because you're working directly with um, the producers. Uh, you know, how do you handle things like, like to bring the cost down of the pineapple fabrics? Do you think that having more, uh, more competitors in the market will help bring the cost down because there's more demand for it? And also stuff like packaging, you know, um, Felicia, you, you talked about packaging as well. Uh, what about gin and Arabella? You know, how, how do you bring down your, uh, how, do you, how do you be sustainable in your packaging and how do you reduce your carbon footprint in, uh, when, you're, when you're shipping? You know, you're all shipped overseas. So uh, were these questions that, that, uh, that you had to take into consideration when you decided to, to start a sustainable business? Uh, okay, let's start with Felicia. So, yeah, I think mentioned earlier about the, the packaging, the idea that mm -hmm. um, we try to reduce single-use plastics where possible. Mm -hmm. So our clothing comes in reusable pouches. Um, yeah, I think on the, the question about material costs, um, um, I think being a fashion newbie helped <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, uh, there's, a, there's kind of like bravery in being naive. Um, yeah, and I think also being a small business um, means that um, a lot of the costs that a uh, fashion brand or multi-label may traditionally spend on other items, such as marketing um, or having a, a large staff count and overheads, um, those are the ways in which we shift costs away um, from the operating of a business and into spending on things that actually matter for us. Um, and that would be the quality of the materials. Yeah, because we, what we hope to do is to create timeless pieces made with good quality and they are like heirlooms that you can wear again and again and you can even pass it down. So um, yeah, for us, I think that um, we, we try to focus on what's um, most important or central to the brand and, and invest the costs in the area. Yeah. Um, Jin, what about you? Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that what you're doing now is actually an extension of your women's wear business already. But when you decided to go sustainable, it wasn't just about um, 
made in store, but it was also about packaging and reducing the carbon footprint and all that. How did you address that? Um, I, I would maybe speak about the cost first because I find mm -hmm. that quite interesting when we try to do make in shop. Everything mm -hmm. went up, all the costs went up. Oh. <laughs> yeah. But I felt that was a lot of area that, um, that perhaps the cost went down, like for example, all the reduction of price in the end of the season, or the storing away things that are not sold. So those are things that, you know, like invisible price, uh, invisible cost that we don't have to into account. So sometimes I find that it's a kind of interesting way to look at it. Like um, sometimes it's just a, bit, a little bit less, but you gain more, you know. So I try, we try not to look at it just on the PL, you know, just numeric uh, gain. And in terms of packaging, it's the same. We ask the same question. What do we want from this? If it means that if we ship something in a paper packaging and things get soiled, is it better or worse? But what we do try to do is like where we cannot eliminate plastic, we try to reuse or recycle. So I think just to, I mean, we use the, the poly bag that contains the clothes like to that, mm -hmm. like use it for storing, use it for this. I mean, like we don't invest in nice boxes in the studio. It's always like a mix shape of uh, all the packing material that we got. And because it's nice when you get that kind of cohesive look, but at the same time, I felt like, why would I buy more plastic cup? You know, if I have this, so maybe try to use that. So that's always balancing, you know, and there's no one mm -hmm. fits, um, equation or this is what we use or not. Just, you know, what yeah. feels like it makes sense for us. Yeah, that's great. You're looking actually at the big picture, which is what I think everyone needs to do as well. Arabella, what are your thoughts on this? Um, so for us, because our user is never, our principal user, child, is never going to buy our product online. Uh, we thought that the packaging uh, of our children's work was a really unique opportunity to educate and gamify uh, the sustainability experience and provide a positive instance um, of great resource use. So we actually, and also um, on the adult user side, a lot of <laughs> a lot of people buy the garments as gifts. So we want to create a really unique experience. So all our garments are sent in small boxes. However, they can be origami folded into a jetpack for the wow. kids to zoom around in by just following some instructions on the other side. And that positive uh, signal and prompt uh, is our um, way of gamifying the experience of, um, and also celebrating uh, the fact that we're sending our items in zero waste recycle um, cardboard, but also prompting them to think about um, everything in their life as a potential kid. I think that's really, really interesting. Okay, I'm going to fast forward, um, no pun intended. You can't talk about uh, sustainability in fashion without talking about fast fashion and slow fashion. Now, fast fashion obviously has uh, tremendous negative effects on the environment. It's uh, highly unethical in terms of production. In order to keep up with the changing fashion trends, the clothes are produced in numerous quantities. Uh, most of the clothes are made of synthetic fibers as opposed to natural fibers, which means they're made using Earth's fossil fuels. All right. Um, now, 60% of our clothes are made that way. And people spend a lot of these clothes. And because they're so cheap, people buy and throw. How do you... Um, okay, I'm going to tie this back to one of the questions that are coming in. Uh, for the rest of you who have questions, please do send us your questions and we'll try and answer them as much as possible. Okay, I'm going to tie this back to one question which someone has sent in. So many Gen Zs and Millennials are advocating for sustainable fashion, but they are still purchasing from fast fashion companies. What do you think is the biggest deterring factor for them and why? So um, I'm going to ask this in two forms. One, what are your thoughts on fast fashion and how do you deter people from um, moving away, to move people away from fast fashion towards a slow fashion model? Uh, okay, let's start with Arabella. So I think communicating to anyone who isn't interested in you, that's just take a person-to-person -person <laughs> basis, is quite hard. Mm -hmm. So um, I think with that instance, taking the mode of evangelizing to those who are interested in you and building those communities organically, um, is the best method because uh, I learned very early on in life there are lots of things you can teach but one thing you can't teach is motivation so if there is um, 
by growing your own community, that will motivate other people to be interested in you because by human nature, by default, uh, we learn from others. So that's the best means. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, students with fast fashion, but that doesn't mean today they can't ever be a student of anything else. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Felicia, I want to ask you about slow fashion and, um, and the idea of uh, perhaps the versatility of clothes. For example, um, looking at uh, the stuff that you have, I think uh, you, you can't define clothes by genres anymore because uh, people want to buy things that, that can, they can use for many different uh, purposes. And I think COVID has, has accelerated that, that versatility as well. What are your thoughts on slow fashion? Mm, yeah, so the loungewear pieces that we create at NOS, mm -hmm. um, I term them versatile to malware. The idea being that we're trying to expand the range of loungewear beyond the home to a full mile radius around your house. So, you know, it's loungewear that you wouldn't be afraid to answer the door in or, you know, pick up like the phone or do a Zoom call in and even you know, run out to run errands and mm -hmm. wearing it. Right. So this idea of versatility um, and especially so since COVID where our boundaries have become so much more fluid and blurred. Um, between the different modes that we have for living, for working, for socializing, things like that. Mm -hmm. It's all happening within the space of the home. Yeah, so um, I think that's our approach towards creating pieces that are versatile and timeless and also very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Because I think if pieces are comfortable, then you would be more inclined to reach out for it more and more. Um, yeah, rather than something which is trendy and would easily go out of style after a couple of seasons. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to pick up on the word trendy and out of style and I'm going to address this question to Jin because I think one of the, one of the appeals of fast fashion is the fact that they, they are very spot on in pushing trends out. But trends come and trends go. How do you, how do you address that, that issue with people who want new designs all the time and how do you convert them to, to buying more classic items? Mm, I can't convert them. I think in the end, is I have, uh, I try to have uh, designs that are more thought through. Mm -hmm. So usually, uh, we kind of like try to think about it this way. Every piece that we tune out, we try to say that does this look good on just a rack? No marketing mm -hmm. around it. How does it right. look? How does it look on the body? And mm -hmm. you know, if it's can it be like museum worthy, like gallery worthy? Like how does it look? So we kind of like try to put it in different state, uh, different place and see like if this mm -hmm. piece can sustain kind of like scrutiny and see how does it feel? So I think that's kind of like more our design approach. And obviously because the user is a big part of like our, mm -hmm. we center all, all the work around the user. Does it feel comfortable? Can she move in it? And also trying to go through her day and say that can she wear this uh, casually? Can she wear, can she dress it up? And um, also like part of the part of the project with the making shop we're really trying to reduce the number of skill that we stock so using the pleats to play on this play on um for example these two these two sides i don't know if you can see me because my screen is blocking it it's actually yes, it it one square and one rectangle but it's actually the same base size but it's just really playing with the illusion of pleats so i think mm -hmm. for us it's really kind of like um trying to use design really and try to design a new look so less trend but just unique pieces that people wow okay i like it you know so it can't kind of put them away from oh, is that trendy is that, it's, it's not we just design pieces right okay now um i'm oh sorry i'm going to talk about um garment use and lifespan because that is a very important part of being uh, sustainable as well uh okay two concepts making a product last as opposed to making a long lasting product all right, and there are very subtle differences in that. Um, I want to push this out to all three of you and um, to find out what your thoughts are on making a product last versus making a long-lasting product. Uh, okay, let's start with Arabella. So I think for us, making a long-lasting product is uh, for kids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so size contingent, uh, which is why we did so much testing, but it's also climate contingent, uh, which is why when we started out, we sent all our items around the world to 100 families, uh, two of which were in Singapore, uh, a couple were in Hawaii, some were in South Africa, some were in Norway. Uh, so it was a range of climates uh, to see whether the material could A, be 
durable. Um, it could be withstand the use life uh, from a life cycle perspective of washing. And then uh, with respect to can the design, a long lasting design, for me, I interpret that as purely aesthetic. So uh, Jim mentioned that uh, she uses the probe of, is this gallery worthy um, for her designs at the end of the design process um, as a limits test. And for us, it's a mixture of the, the two. Uh, we have such a unique aesthetic. So um, typically our customer buys into that from the get-go. So that's not so much of a problem. But for us, the functionality is core, uh, is a core concern and with such a, uh, I think utilitarian on the team, team. Uh, that uh, to you not do that, that would be doing a disjustice and providing a poor service. All right. Um, great. Jin, what are your thoughts on this? Making a product last versus making a long lasting product? I don't know, as usual, probably both. <laughs> it's uh, equally important in both of them. And what we do try to do is uh, salvage the clothes. Like sometimes people come to us, say we iron the pleats uh, by mistake and we replete it, you know, like uh, just make it last as long as you can. Mm -hmm. and, you know, because I do feel like there is that kind of emotional attached to clothing that I, I personally am that kind of person. I get emotionally attached to things. And uh, mm -hmm. so I don't own a lot of things because I scared to get attached to them. So I'm kind of like kind of weird that I'm a producer of goods. And uh, But I think I do believe in having less and uh, treasure it a bit more. So we kind of like try to help the customer to keep it as long as they can. So if things that we can fix, replete, and, you know, we usually take it in. Sometimes I even plate brands that not ours just so that we should get to keep it like... Uh, but I think for me, yeah, it's a mix of both, I would say. All right. Okay, hold that thought about hoarding. Uh, whilst I go on to Felicia, Felicia, I want to ask you about this, this thing which um, I read about um, your label, uh, the cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and tie that also to traceability? Because I think that's, that's something that's really interesting. Mm, yeah, so this idea of cradle-to-cradle um, -cradle and, and that when we design for the lifespan of a product, um, we hope that there is a certain um, way that we consider the impact of, of something. Um, so when you mentioned earlier about how do you make a product last versus making a long-lasting product, I think what came to mind is that, um, firstly, in terms of making a product last, um, when there are changes in, for example, in your body size or um, as your body changes over time, being human, um, we come up with collections where the waistbands are kind of adjustable, um, the, the pants and dresses all come with adjustable waistbands. So this is something that gives you a little bit more room <laughs> to, to accommodate that. Um, and versus making a long lasting product, um, I think that speaks about something that is timeless, that can be worn again and again, mm -hmm. um, something which is seasonless. Um, and, but at the same time, not too long lasting because, for example, if you use polyester, it takes thousands of years to biodegrade versus mm -hmm. the use of materials like organic cotton and pencil, which would be able to, <laughs> to last the lifespan of its use, um, but be able to biodegrade at the end of the day. Yeah, so I think when you mentioned um, cradle to cradle, that really came into play, especially when we were researching um, pineapple textiles. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because why, why pineapples, right? Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned a little bit earlier about how um, pineapples are already created right now. There's, there's tons of agricultural byproduct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, by taking the waste that is generated, it's normally going to lead to air pollution when it's burnt and landfilled and converting it into something which is usable. I think it speaks to this process of taking waste and converting it into something usable and therefore um, taking... Yeah, part of the continuity of resource that we mentioned. Mm, okay. Now, um, you talked about traceability as well. Can you, can you touch on that very briefly? Um, yeah, so because um, right now we are designing the whole supply chain where mm -hmm. the leaves are from farm to fiber to fabric. So mm -hmm. at each of these key stages, they take place in a different location um, with different suppliers and makers. Um, so our aim is really to, at the end of the day, have a QR code attached to the garment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So as a customer, you will be able to very easily scan it and tell where the suppliers are based and even have pictures of the people who made your clothes. Right. So I think that, um, yeah, increasingly this idea of traceability will be very important. 
Great. Okay. Now, um, hang on to that thought because I have a question that just came in, which I'm going to ask in a short while. But um, I'm going to jump in here first and talk about seasonless fashion, which um, Jin has mentioned. And all of you have uh, seasonless fashion models, as well as uh, the circular fashion economy, because I think those are very, very important buzzwords right now. Uh, why did you decide to go seasonless? And um, was it a conscious effort? And do you think that that has helped your business. Um, I'm going to start with Jin because uh, you, you brought this up earlier. Uh, you know, uh, I think of course, because I mean like the brand, the brand started about a decade ago. So I, without <laughs> telling you some background story, but uh, yeah. it started over in Israel. And uh, in Israel, that's more kind of like... Um, yeah, a, a bit more of a, a lot more than Singapore, but not so extreme in between the seasons. So that was a need to change over a season. The minute it hits like winter or like in summer, so the season change over quite quickly. In Singapore, less, but also because like when we choose to design something that is a little bit easier to transit, so layering rather than uh, working with heavier coats or that mm -hmm. stuff, it was a lot easier for inventory and all that. But uh, so I think it kind of like uh, became our products that we design eventually so we don't do heavily with like coat and jacket but work mainly with like separate uh, things that are easy more easily layered it is obviously quite uh, easier to be a bit more sustainable because you don't have to cut, on the, cut off the selling date and but it's mm -hmm. not uh, I, I don't think it's uh, so much that every country can do it because you, you have that change of weather in the end of the day the clothing are providing the protection to our climate mm -hmm. in Singapore we mm -hmm. might not view it but I think it is another way to look at it all right. Uh, okay, Arabella, you have um, a very unique uh, approach to uh, not just being seasonless, but also circular because your clothes can last you through many different sizes and, and now you're doing adult wear as well. Uh, do, you, do you think that has helped you uh, become even more sustainable? And uh, what are your plans for the future in, in, in uh, encouraging people to buy more pieces because if, if someone can use a piece for seven years, for instance, how do you encourage, how do you build a business to encourage people to keep buying whilst, uh, whilst maintaining the, the, the responsible fashion ethos that your company has embraced? Yeah, so that's, that's um, always, always a tiring or challenge. Or challenge. Uh, uh, however, however um, uh, for a business to be viable. viable. <laughs> Um, it, it has, has to answer, answer these questions, questions uh, which, which I think is also sometimes forgotten, forgotten when sustainability uh, businesses are talked about, about because it is a business at the end of the day. So um, for us, it's identifying uh, great solutions, new applications of our IP, uh, potentially in non-compete markets. So we're uh, looking at a few uh, more, something which was uh, a huge success, success was our reusable face mask, mask uh, which went, went on to win the Times Best Inventions in 2020. Uh, uh, no, 2020. Oh, I can't remember anymore. Uh, it's one, one long, long COVID, COVID that. 2021. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I think on account of uh, the, the low price point, point because we, we have, have lots, lots of lots of. Uh, fans who necessarily don't, don't have, have children, children. Uh, that, that was a really great, great entry product for them. them. So, so there's, there's also lots of um, opportunities within the lifestyle and, and products, uh, product, product design, design solutions. solutions. So, so uh, just because that necessarily you were a fashion designer doesn't mean you uh, should continue with the fashion. And um, Felicia, you know, um, with the kind of product, you know, earlier we talked about the versatility of the clothes and all that. Um, with all three of you, do you think that um, with every season coming out with products that match the previous season, so you build on your wardrobe rather than, than building seasonal items, uh, if you, if you, uh, with your design ethos of, of designing classic items that match mm -hmm. every single item in, in your shop, it would encourage people to continue shopping at Jin Lee mm -hmm. and building up the wardrobe without having to buy... Um, frivolous seasonal pieces mm -hmm. do you think that that yeah, is yeah. Uh, something that will help your business I, I'm not catering to all different uh, aspects of her, of her lifestyle. So that's things that I don't do. Uh, I don't do a, um, right, right. a lot of like basic tea, etc. So obviously okay, she should, okay. she's still shopping for other places. But what we right, get a right. lot is like with the statement pieces, they always just come back for like more colors or like shorter mm -hmm. length, longer length. So we got quite a lot of that kind of repeat customer. And um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I think in the end of the day, like we do, like we, we focus our work on uh, the unique pieces, the signature mm -hmm. pieces that makes a difference for the customer that can wear from night, uh, day to night more than you know her, her total lifestyle because we can't do everything we are small we are small brand right, right. At the end of the day. Yeah. but you know um i think it it's a great business model because then you build up your following and every season they come to buy new things that they can match with yeah. the previous seasons yeah yeah they do that yeah yeah okay felicia i'm very very uh, interested in in um your development of the pineapple fabrics but um in relation to um something which um, is very close to my heart. It's called cruelty-free fashion because you can't talk about responsible fashion without uh, addressing the issue of cruelty-free um, fashion and beauty, you know, against animal testing and not using animal products. You know, a lot of companies are developing new materials like leather made from great skins and orange skins, which means you can actually grow your leather in a lab. Um, there are also... Um, organizations for example london fashion week has banned um fur on their runway let's see um yes they've, they've banned um designers from using animal fur on the catwalks and then there are pledges by brands like burberry um, gucci and versace to go fur free um, and in the same vein there are companies like adidas and g-star raw which are doing what um, felicia's doing they are developing apparel made from um, waste materials for example ocean plastics you know, um, do you think that this? Uh, I want I want to hear your thoughts on this. You know, not just uh, not just on recycling waste, but um, the eventual moving away from uh, perhaps animal byproducts. What What are your thoughts on that? Uh, let's start with Felicia. Yeah, I do see cruelty free fashion as a trend that's set to continue and to grow. Um, I think not just in the sphere of fashion, but also in terms of food and diets, a lot of people mm -hmm. are turning towards vegan diets. Right. Um, yeah, for us, I think it's, it's still nascent, but we do have um, a couple of homeware products that use pea silk. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a type of silk where um, the silkworms are not harmed when they are harvested, when the cocoons are harvested. Yeah, and it's, it's a fairly um, new material that actually can be found in Indonesia. Um, and, and we do see some customers um, willing to pay the markup for a, a, a material that's kind of rare because uh, it's cruelty free. Yeah, and on the note of, um, there are a lot of interesting materials coming up right now, like mushroom leather and pineapple leather as well. Yeah, so if um, possible, it would be a very exciting direction to pursue to see how to explore alternatives. Arabella, any thoughts on, on, um, on this? And do you see yourself uh, branching into R&D and using more uh, unusual fabrics and, and uh, for your collections? So on the topic of cruelty-free, I think uh, a lot of those brands you just mentioned, I think less than 1% of their products use fur. So the fact that they switch to going cruelty-free I think is more emblematic of another marketing campaign that they um, So uh, I think the subject of cruelty free versus uh, raw innovation, I think uh, is the latter is more interesting, uh, especially when, however, there are countries which are, for example, Morocco, Morocco Italy, um, Spain, that have uh, really rely on the, the use of leather, leather. for example, uh, just one instance, and, and on the flip side, Thailand, Thailand are uh, maybe trying to find a use for their byproduct product of their pineapple grape. Uh, so, so I do you think, think at one side from the product, product uh, user, user side, uh, uh, yes, yeah, it feels really, really good, good to get yeah, something which is cruelty free, free potentially, but on the other side, side there are long standing industries which, which have, have maybe been, been around for millennia, millennia that, that need to be considered to you, uh, because uh, what, what, what is cruel cool in that, that sense of that? that. So, those, uh, so I, I think cruelty free is much, much larger, larger than just the product consumer. That's great. Okay, I'm going to um, ask one of the questions that someone has um, posted. Okay, and this is related to um, R&D. You know, all of you have some form of R&D, either it's in the way the clothes grow or in the fabrics and all that. And um, this can actually push uh, costs up. 
Now, how do you foresee scalability as an issue given the additional considerations like cost, process, complexity that have to be factored into sustainable design? Uh, let's start with uh, let's start with Felicia. Yeah, I think um, scalability is a is is a good problem. It's something that um, all businesses have to grapple with, whether mm -hmm. or not sustainability is part of the conversation. Right. Um, yeah, and I think the benefits of scalability or scaling up is, of course, the reduction in costs mm -hmm. and um, the increase in, in revenue or the pool. Um, and in our case, that would be something good because we hope to be able to preserve heritage craft and being able to grow the market for the artisans mm -hmm. on a global scale would definitely be something that uh, would be a plus. Yeah, um, I think complexity naturally comes into play um, with the scaling of any type of endeavor or business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, possibly then it, it's a matter of uh, working out the process in terms of the supply chain and having checks and balances. Yeah, to to see that um, see how scalability can be managed uh, at a, at the right rhythm and pace. Mm -hmm. Jin, what about you? You mentioned earlier that um, with with this whole movement, it's actually become more extensive. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you balance this? Um, I mean, first of all. R&D is expensive and mm -hmm. customer might not want to pay for it. I think it's the same question that you ask about Gen Z, like uh, yes. that they still buy fast fashion or... Mm -hmm. I, I felt like um, R&D is expensive and sometimes people don't understand, you know, why is clothes not cheap or because there is a development that goes into it. So mm -hmm. I've, I've, you know, on, on the other hand, you know, if you want it to be more, if you want the younger generation to buy uh, perhaps brands that are slower or more sustainable, you know, they might not want to pay the price or can pay the price. So therefore, mm -hmm. fast fashion seems like an easy option. And for, we know like for fast fashion, it's kind of like a lot of ripping off. So you don't have to do the R&D. It's a lot quicker. You take it, you produce it, out it goes, you know, mm -hmm. so it really reduced the cost on uh, production and obviously choosing cheaper uh, material etc so for me i don't have a clear kind of like um, what's the outcome of it but uh, you know as our brand stand for that we were just going to continue doing it so even it's going to cost me more but this is what we do i mean we are designers we are not like uh, meant to scale in such a, a quantity because then that would be you know perhaps a very different business model and that's not us therefore the mm -hmm. price is higher but we are working on the smaller and slower growth i guess like uh, mm -hmm. all right arabella what about you um you've got a very unique uh, uh, concept where clothes grow with you. And um, how, how do you balance that? that uh, balancing the, the idea of increased uh, R&D costs and, um, and scalability? Uh, so I think for us, um, um, the investment, investment is uh, uh, obviously really important, important. Uh, uh, and having an understanding of the key business model. model. Is really, really cool, cool uh, to our type, type of business. business. Um, so um, recently, I uh, just bought the next stage of R and D and creative company. We just put uh, uh, a million pounds, uh, and, and a lot of that, that was uh, done, done through uh, crowdfunding. Uh, so um, it was all support of the community, which is great because. Uh, that, that I think, think the ultimate, ultimate um, education, education piece on uh, sustainable business, uh, uh, bringing your consumers and inviting them, them on your, your journey, journey with you, um, providing, providing real estate, not not just the end product, 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 Research, research. There's, there's basic, basic research. research. For example, For example that's, that's uh, what, what is, is a mass of carbon. carbon. That's, that's basic, basic understanding of scientific principles. And then there's, there's applied, applied research, research, which is, oh, oh now, now we know, we know that. that, what, what can we do, do with the information? And then there's, there's uh, uh, commercial, commercial research, research, which, which is still good R&D, and that's on the actual common scale. And most brands sit up there. Uh, however, there's, there's a lot, lot of public, public funding, funding available for lower down research, 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 research,
that sustainability means a more expensive product? And two, do you feel that sustainable or ethical brands only attract a very niche market? All right, uh, and do you consider this a pro and con? Uh, okay, Felicia, what are your thoughts on this? I think speaking as a consumer or a shopper myself, mm -hmm. um, one way that I think about it is as cost per wear rather than as absolute cost of the product. Mm -hmm. So if it's something that I, um, when I, when I purchase, I believe I would wear at least 30 times um, and, and it's well made, it's good quality, I don't see it going out of style or trend. Mm -hmm. um, then if, if I were to do the sums and, and wear it over the, the 30 wears, the cost per wear would actually be lower compared to something which is trendy, um, but worn just a few times and then disposed or discarded. Yeah, so I think that that could be one way to kind of reframe how we choose to shop. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And um, do, you, do you only attract a niche market or do you see more and more people embracing your brand? Yeah, I think um, it, it depends on the markup that people are prepared to pay for mm -hmm. sustainable clothing. Right. And items and that varies from person to person mm -hmm. um I, I think at nost we try to we're not in the luxury markup range so mm -hmm. we try to keep it as affordable as as possible so that that would help to hopefully encourage more people to try out um a, a piece of clothing that's sustainably made um with, with natural materials mm -hmm. yeah, and hopefully you know to to get more people into that trend where they try it for themselves and actually like it great Jin, what about you? What are your thoughts on, on um, combating the consumer mentality that um, mm -hmm. it's a more expensive product? I think we got used to clothes being cheap. I think that's mm -hmm. my point of view. Yeah. That, you know, for me is to perhaps reverse that a little bit. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not that old, but I remember my grandma can knit or, you know, my mom can sew, but uh, I don't know if people have that now. So I think for us, we kind of like more on the school of trying to get that back, bring the craft mm -hmm. back, like what Felicia was saying, like bring the craft back. So when people mm -hmm. are more exposed to it, you kind of know how things are being made and uh, that changes your relationship with it, you, you know, and uh, the value of things changes. Mm -hmm. But when you, someone out there make my clothes and I don't know nothing about it, like it, just I got used to that price. I think that's my point of view. Mm. All right. Uh, for Arabella, your clothes are uh, quite niche in the sense that uh, it was meant for children that grow. And then now that you're, you're starting to do adult wear, do you think that um, that's a niche market for you? Or um, are you reaching out to people who may not have children but who are interested in your clothes as well? And how do you address that issue? Yeah, yeah. so um, on account of it, the project going viral, we've got um, an application of the Gendra. So uh, when we released the mask, the reasonable face covering, uh, a huge amount of users were able to support us because there's uh, a lot of ambassadorship uh, from that that they want uh, sustainable consumer certificate. You want uh, there's a huge proportion. And then there are uh, people who want to um, buy items for functionality for uh, However, I think it's the job of the business owner, owner to balance, balance those messages and um, their responsibility too. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not, never uh, either or. <laughs> okay, uh, now this, this is also kind of uh, related to that question. Uh, someone wants to know, do you think that in the future more will go into thrifting, reforming or reworking clothes, buying secondhand and more sustainable clothes and why? I'm going to throw this open to all three of you. Anyone want to take this? Um, I think, I think um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be taking a little bit of it. Um, um, so, so I think it's not, not necessarily about thrifting, thrifting things, but, but I think, think um, the economies of scale, um, opening you know, up uh, and uh, repurposing uh, the value of vintage items, I think there's always been a good, been a good heritage, heritage of that in the UK. Okay. But for, for example, example uh, Living in China, China and the South, South Asia, Asia. Um, and you know so, so many, many uh, huge warehouses, warehouses that have uh, shipped vintage, vintage clothes, clothes from Europe, Europe to Thailand, Thailand. Um, and then, then <laughs> European uh, vintage, vintage shopping, shopping go to Thailand, Thailand buy them, buy them for the really cheap, and then bring them, them to Europe. Europe. So, so, um, I think, I think it's, it's all about consumer mentality of what, what is uh, luxury. I think that's the main major, because I think clothes are such a symbol of status, they say to mind, they say to Social, social state, 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 state,
it, it's and, and like like all, all art, it's a reflection of society at the time. time. So, so I think at, at the moment, moment uh, the risking second hand um, is, is considered potentially luxurious, luxurious and, and maybe um, yeah, speaks to a higher, higher esoteric standard. standard. So, so um, I think with, with that, that in mind, mind it could potentially uh, increase, increase, but like, like things which are pretentious can be quick, quick, like the other like. like so it's that, that balance of, of what, is what is the motivation, the motivation of, of the vintage consumer. consumer. Great. Okay, I'm going to address the next question to our two um, Singaporean ladies because there is a there is a kind of a mindset. I'm not sure if it still exists that uh, vin- that people do not want to buy secondhand clothes or vintage clothes. Do you see that mindset still existing, or do you think it's changed and has it affected uh, uh, the secondhand market or or upcycling, for instance? Um, anyone? Yeah. I can go first. I, as a, when I was a student, I really enjoy it. Like uh, you go to you, you go to thrift shop and you look for like uh, treasure mm-hmm. and all that. Like it's really really exciting and it's also like how you what you're going to do to it. So that's that whole like well I'm going to customize it and all that stuff. So I really enjoy it. And I think in Asia culture we have a thing about not uh, owning people's stuff. Like it's second hand mm-hmm. is not first hand. I do. Th- I don't feel that it's changing. Like, uh, I mean, like, thrifting is such a word now. You see, like, you know, our, our younger colleagues are coming in with, like, secondhand stuff and taking pride. And I don't think it's a good thing. I think, if anything, it makes them think about being in an individual rather than, you know, oh, what is that? Uh, what is that trend and all that? And for, the, for those, um, I, I like, I personally think that, you know, fashion allows you to be who you are and you should, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think it's good. It's changing. All right, Felicia, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree. I think that the the market um is kind of split. There there are still people, significant groups of people that mm-hmm. whenever you say it's something recycled, then some funny things come in come in their head, you know, like, oh, what do you mean recycle come from where yeah. <laughs> has it been used before? Um, but at the same time, we do see this trend where not just clothing, but there's this whole shared economy where people are mm-hmm. open to it, not just sharing your grab rights, your taxi rights, but also yeah. sharing your homes, your co co-working, co-living types of environment and um, increasingly, we also see a lot of fashion rental companies mm-hmm. that are doing pretty well. Um, yeah, and younger ladies and men are, are not averse to sharing items, um, thrifting as well as buying secondhand. So I do see that uh, as a change on the horizon, increasingly so. All right. Okay, I'm going to combine uh, our next two questions. They're really, really good questions and they are, they are um, applicable to all three of you. So I'd like to hear from all three of you. Um, one of the questions is, how, do you worry about consumers being affected by sustainability fatigue with so many brands now claiming to be sustainable? And related to that, what is your opinion on greenwashing with companies? Because, you know, as with all trendy things, all companies want to jump on the bandwagon. You know, earlier we talked about companies uh, that, are, that are moving away from, uh, from uh, animal products no, but uh, they are actually greenwashing because it only makes up a small percentage of their, their businesses. So how, how do you address this? You know, um, I'm, I'm asking all three of you, how do you address the sustainability fatigue now that um, you are joined by so many other people that claim to be sustainable? And what is your advice to people uh, who, who want to be able to tell the difference between a company that's greenwashing and a company that's genuine? Let's go back to you, Felicia. Let's start with you. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we, we do see many fast fashion brands also offering green products now. Um, while it may be a step in the right direction, there are also a lot of countervailing factors, such as um, if you're producing like 52 collections a year, the amount of waste that's being generated, mm-hmm. um, and then you weigh that against having a couple of items that are made of organic cotton, I think um, customers are becoming more and more discerning. Mm. Um, about whether or not the brand is greenwashing and making their purchasing choices based on that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a good point about sustainability fatigue. Um, I think that as more and more brands uh, jump on the sustainability bandwagon, what becomes very critical is the idea of authenticity or proof. Um, yeah, and, and that requires a certain level of transparency um, to, for brands to be able to be open about where they're producing, who's, mm-hmm. the, who's producing it for them, um, and tracing down to their, uh, all the different suppliers involved in the supply chain. Yeah, so I think 
transparency increasingly will become a main feature of brands who seek to be sustainable because customers will want to be accountable. Yeah. Mm, okay. And Jin, what is your opinion on this? I think very soon, um, we're not using the word being sustainable, but I think it's just like every brand should be in a way. So I don't, mm -hmm. I think it's a, I don't know. I feel like, uh, like I said, I never thought like we are or in the, you know, I felt like it's a, um, I feel like it's uh, just slowing it down. For, for us, it's really slowing it down because mm -hmm. like, I think the speed of growth, like I say clothes are not meant to be so cheap, but you know, because in order to drive growth, everything was produced in bulk in order to drive down the price. And we know that MOQ is high. The minimum quantity of order is high because they want to keep the price low. And I can't, yeah. if I don't want to produce that quantity, I have to pay a premium. So I pay the premium and that's the, the business model that we choose. So I think for us, it's, uh, we never thought about that we are in or out. I just think that this is what we do at the end of the day. And I do think that, you know, whether greenwashing or not is good because it got a lot of people aware. And I think we have one planet. So what is you greenwashing? And you know, it just got a lot of people aware. And I think in the end of the day, the shopper is control it so if more people that are aware more people ask the question i think every company i can't say i'm sustainable because like, how can anyone claim it? it's just impossible because uh, what we can try to do is just do our best effort because it's all the same planet we're talking about right like uh, mm, yeah i think that's great and I'm, I'm hoping that eventually the word sustainability will be um, not the exception but it's it's going to be the norm i, I do and, want to uh, i do want to say it's just one last thing i feel sure. like there should be more regulation because sometimes mm -hmm. even for us when we try to purchase a raw material and all that you mm -hmm. know well, that's recycled but you know it's very very difficult to get some kind of like a body to look after you know this mm -hmm, kind of thing mm -hmm. Because, you know, you really anyone can sell you anything and say what it is, you know, especially when you start to source from overseas and all that. So I feel like that regulation is a bit harder for me. And, you know, you ask for the certificate and you get some kind of certificate. Okay, great. You know, so, you know, in the end that you do have to end up uh, finding, um, um, you know, that's not a, a lot of uh, supplies out there mm -hmm. that smaller brand can touch on. So that's the key point, you know. So if you have a more established raw material brand, usually they want to sell still at a bigger quantity. I see. Okay, now we've got so many questions and not enough time. So I'm going to try and combine all these questions and, and do a speed round very, 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 very quickly. You talked about supply. Okay, um, one of the questions which I think is very relevant is um, your key suppliers and all the workers that are, that are at the bottom of the food chain, uh, how do you check that they receive fair living wages and how do you ensure this? Uh, okay. I'm going to direct this to Felicia because you work directly with, with um, and, and more so with these. Uh, very, very quickly, how do you, how do you check this? Um, yeah, so for us, we, we make it a point to visit our makers firsthand yeah, and uh, to, to build a relationship with them. Um, and so we just ask them directly, yeah, how much do you pay your worker? <laughs> yeah, and, and obviously some of them are more comfortable with sharing, some are not. Yeah, but they would tell us like, okay, oh, yeah, I'm paying minimum wage, I'm paying X amount. Um, and, and I guess that's that's how we try to verify yeah, um, by through the relationships that we have with them and, and through a process of uh, just integrity. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. This question is specifically directed at you, Felicia. Again, it's a speed round. So very, very quickly, I'm going to try and squeeze in as many questions as possible. What is the comfort level of pineapple fabric or plastic waste derived fabric compared to our usual fabrics that our skins are used to? Yeah, that's a great question because pineapples naturally um there is um like a certain kind of spikiness which is why uh, we have to do this research into developing it for lightweight apparel use um yeah so the thing is with next evo the pineapple yarns that we are using are not 100 percent pineapple we moderate that by blending it with other materials such as tensile as well as cotton so in terms of um, hand feel and like against the skin it's a bit more similar to linen than it is to cotton yeah, and because the fibers are very strong and it's like breathable. So I guess linen is, the scratchiness of linen is a bit of a, a good mental picture. Fabulous. Okay, last two questions very, very quickly. Now this question um, uh, is directed to the artistic and designer in all three of you. Okay, how do you maintain design innovation and integrity with being sustainable? You know, um, uh, Okay, I'm going to leave it at that very, very quickly. Uh, let's start with Jin. I think for us, um, we try not to do, you know, even if it's uh, organic cotton, you know, even if it's with the best intention, you don't need another basic tea from me. That's what okay. my point is. All right. Um, Arabella, what about you? Uh, design innovation and integrity. 
So, so I think, I think for us, it's, it's always, always keeping, keeping our core, core tenants, our, our common uh, top of line. line. So, so uh, we're really, really on a mission to introduce you to and we're going to start asking the next generation. And we're using an internal group of um, yeah. what, what it would, it would be like, like you to a colony on one So I think that that line is our guiding line. All right. And Felicia, what about you? What are your thoughts on um, design innovation and integrity? Yeah, our, our brand is, um, has always been inspired by architecture and cities mm -hmm. and textures and because I'm an architect. So I guess yeah. that has always been the kind of the DNA of the, the brand. And I think that's always be, um, been a very rich source of inspiration for us <laughs> yeah, and sustainability for us. It's, it's a value like, like um, the other two brands over here. So I think integrity it really boils down to how well we try to live out these this values that we have and implemented yeah. in small ways. I think it's great. And it's a perfect example of how you can have design integrity as well as keep your, your ethos and your values as well and, and come up with interesting products all the time. Okay, one final question for all of you in one sentence. How do you see the fashion retail landscape evolving between now and 2030? Um, okay, two sentences. And what role will sustainability play in our landscape? Um, Okay, Arabella, let's start with you, very quickly. Right, yeah. I think it'll be it'll really be interesting, interesting to see um, how, how physical, physical glass is online, online uh, from, from an addiction, addiction uh, internet addiction, addiction perspective, perspective and uh, modular, modular reality, reality uh, changes. I think that'll be interesting. Great. Um, Jin, what about you? I think for the physical retail, have, uh, they have to have more reason for the consumer to come in so that it's not mm -hmm. just transactional. Uh, there's a lot of talk about experiential and all that uh, retail for retail. And then that's also the metaverse. <laughs> that oh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, spectrum, really. So I think a lot will change over the next uh, seven years that you gave. Wow, yeah. Oh, my God. Seven years. Yeah. Is it 2022 now? Eight years now. Eight years, yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, okay, Felicia, what about you? I think transparency will be a big thing. So we'll see maybe blockchain playing a bigger part in fashion. Right. And also the whole idea of storytelling, I think that will just continue to increase and how sustainability will not just be something that you present in statistics, but something that could be experienced as a shopper being in that space. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And on that note, um, I'd like to thank all three of you as, uh, for joining us today, Jin Lee, Felicia To, and Arabella Turek. Um, for joining us in this very interesting conversation. We could go on and on and on because there's so much to talk about. To all of you for joining us on this, uh, on this panel design, um, organized by Design Singapore. Thank you, Design Singapore, for bringing us all together. If you want to re-watch this, Design Singapore will be posting this on their YouTube channel. You can also follow their social media platforms to find out where um, they will be reposting uh, uh, this, this videos of today's panel. Um, for those of you who are following the front row, uh, in the coming months, this entire panel is also going to be posted on the front row. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. And thank you for all your really wonderful questions. I wish we had time to answer every single one of them. Uh, my name is Daniel Boy. Thank you for allowing me to moderate today's panel. And I'd like to hand you back to Felicia from Design Singapore. Thank you so much, Daniel, Jin, Felicia To, and Arabella for taking the time to join us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been so great to hear all of your insights. And to our attendees as well, thank you for being here with us and we hope that you learned something valuable too. So for those of you who are joining us from Singapore, do drop by the National Design Centre to visit the Waste Refinery Exhibition to learn more about how design can tackle one of the biggest sustainability challenges of our time, waste. You'll also be able to find petite please garments on display alongside other innovative products in fashion and beyond. At the same time, you'll also be able to visit the Good Design Research Showcase to explore how designers are addressing challenges of the future to ultimately create a better world by design. So last but not least, please, before you go, we would really appreciate it if you could do a quick online survey to share your feedback with us by scanning the QR code that you see on the left. And if you'd like to find out more about the programs at the National Design Centre, do scan the QR code that you see on the right. So this is where we will leave you now. Thank you once again for joining us today, and we definitely hope to see you at our future events. Take care, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>